turned into wine. Open the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you. None like you. Into the darkness you shine. Out of the ashes we rise. There's no one like you. None like you. Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer. Awesome and power. Our God. Our God. Into the darkness you shine. Out of the ashes we rise. You are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God. Our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God. If our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? Oh, who could stand against? And what could stand against? family of Valley Christian. My name is Lester Mead, and I'm super excited to because today is my first opportunity to share a lesson in 2023. And just as a reminder, our theme for this year is courageous. And that comes from 1 Corinthians 16, uh, 13 and 14. Scripture reads, be on your guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong, do everything in love. Uh, now, a great model uh, for courageous, 
uh, has been uh, one of my friends, Delano Stewart. The first service of this year, uh, we recognized him for uh, being a minister in Valley Christian for 10 years. So it's a pretty big deal since uh, a lot of times, especially in our family of churches, ministers don't stay at one church for uh, definitely not 10 years. So it's it's not very common, but the, the consistency of service, of giving, of relationship, of sharing the word uh, has been uh, seen in his life and in Nadine as well. Because obviously if Delano has been here for 10 years, Nadine's been here for 10 years and they both served uh, in an amazing way. But uh, he was uh, recognized in the first service uh, of the year. Uh, so it was a really great kickoff as well as our theme, Courageous. Uh, what we're gonna talk about today is courage in the body of Christ. If you want to keep it with a theme, it would be courageous in the body of Christ. Uh, so that's what we're going to talk about today. What, what do we need to be courageous and ambitious in when it comes to the body of Christ or the church? So let's pray and then we will begin our Bible study. God, we're grateful for this time to open up your word, to delight in it, to delight in you, uh, to worship you, to build our faith. God, I pray that everything that is shared uh, today in this lesson uh, would just help all of us to grow in our knowledge of scripture, how everything connects, and just understand even your nature a little bit more so that we have opportunities to love you more uh, and also that we can be even more devoted uh, to the body of Christ. We love you and we thank you for this time. Pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So here's some of the things that we're gonna go over today. And some of these might be uh, kind of newer concepts, but it's a new year, new theme. It's gonna be a great opportunity to talk about some new things. One of the things that we're gonna talk about is divine patterns. And this probably isn't something that you've heard before, but the reason why we're gonna go over some of these patterns is to really share that God brings order into chaos. So we're gonna see some things in scripture that provides an order, a reference, a pattern uh, for us to uh, gain encouragement from and also uh, have a, a deeper sense of faith and understanding. Um, we also, the, the, the point of it also is to see that God has a plan for us and he's had a plan for us uh, since the beginning. Another thing we're gonna go over is Eastern and Western theology. Uh, I love to discuss uh, theology. I love to talk about it because it's really the study of the nature of God and who God is. And it really helps us to understand how we can connect to the spirit and not be so bound to the flesh. Uh, another thing we're gonna talk about is early church teaching. We're gonna see where the apostle Paul, uh, both what he modeled and he taught about the early church. And also we're gonna look at what Jesus uh, modeled and taught uh, for his disciples. And last of all, we're going to talk about some daily practicals because faith is really living our life differently based on what we believe. So we always have to talk about what are we going to do different in our life as we follow Jesus. So when we get into theology, we're going to talk about um, some patterns that the, the Christian man and woman can reflect on in order to have some kind of, not necessarily a measurement, but some kind of an idea of forward momentum to understand God more or to gain uh, enlightenment, to gain a uh, greater understanding, uh, ideally a closeness to God and to have the opportunity to be in his presence. So go ahead and turn your Bibles to Exodus chapter 19 and we're going to look um, at one pattern uh, being the mountain of the Lord. Now, there's a lot of things that are going to connect here um, from the New Testament. If you know about the, the transfiguration of Jesus, it's in Matthew 17, where Jesus takes Peter, James, and John uh, up to uh, a high mountain. 
and there he is transfigured before them. He, he begins to glow. He's radiant. Uh, God speaks. Moses and Elijah uh, appear there, and um, the uh, apostles, three apostles, were witness to all this. And uh, Elijah's significant because uh, he went up to uh, Mount Horeb where God spoke to him. Uh, and also we're going to read in Exodus 19 where uh, Moses is um, at Mount Sinai where um, he gets the, the Ten Commandments. He speaks to God. God speaks uh, to him. And uh, just as a reference, uh, most scholars believe that Mount Horeb and Mount Sinai are the, are the same place. So it's very significant. So the first pattern is this mountain of the Lord. Now, I'm not, I'm not big on uh, numbers or all these other things, but I'm going to point out some things because uh, I know that some people are. And just to be aware of when we read the scripture, you'll see things like you'll see the number three several times. So uh, obviously, uh, the the symbol that represents a mountain is a triangle. It has three sides, three points. A lot of times, a triangle would will be um, a symbol of the Trinity: Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. What what makes this unique is the idea of the mountain and God being at the top of the mountain calling Moses up to travel up the mountain. Uh, but we're going to see where we're going to bring in Jesus and the Holy Spirit as well. So let's read the scripture and then we'll start to look at this pattern a little bit. In Exodus 19 verse 1, I'll be reading from the NIV version. It says, on the first day of the third month after the Israelites left Egypt, on that very day, they came to the desert of Sinai. After they set out from Rephidim, they entered the desert of Sinai, and Israel camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob, and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the, old, the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. So the Sinai Peninsula is where the, the, the Israelites left uh, Egypt the Sinai Peninsula is actually still Egypt today, but back then it was kind of like a, a little bit of a nomad's land and or nomad, nomad's land. And they traveled there and it's, it's mostly desert in the northern area, probably near where, where they where they crossed. But in the southern part of Sinai, it's, it's very mountainous. So they traveled through the desert. Now they're at the base of the mountain. Let's continue reading in verse 16. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain trembled violently. As the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and the voice of God answered him. The Lord descended to the top of, the, of Mount Sinai and called Moses to the top of the mountain. So Moses went up. So we're going to look at this triangle that represents uh, the mountain of the Lord. And at top is where God is, where we hope to have a divine encounter with him. Ideally, in this walk of being uh, uh, not only a believer of God, but a follower of Jesus, 
Our goal is to, to know who God is and how we can love him. And we want to be in his presence and we want to worship him. That's really our ultimate goal. Our number one thing we want is just to be connected with God. So at the top of the mountain, we have this divine encounter, and that's basically the head. That's the top. Now, in the middle of the mountain is the, the body of the mountain. Now, the climbing a mountain is pretty treacherous. Uh, the, obviously, the steeper, the more, the more dangerous. But think about it. Uh, I remember seeing a, uh, a meme in this past week where it showed these uh, mountain climbers, probably like trekking up to Mount Everest. And the caption was, I finally found a picture of my parents on the way to school. That idea of going to school uphill both ways. But going up a mountain, you're going uphill. Uh, it's not easy. Gravity wants to pull you back, but your own personal energy has to drive you forward. Um, you know, I don't know, an hour in, two hours in, three hours in, you begin to, your heart's pounding, your legs are burning. Uh, you might have to be scrambling over rocks, climbing up cliffs. Uh, who knows if there was a trail there? So you had to uh, manage through brush, manage through uh, uh, sharp rocks, uh, uh, crevices, uh, maybe have to build little bridges to get across. So it's, it, it's an adventure. It's not a cakewalk. It's not a straight line. It's, it's zigzagging. It's climbing. It takes effort. It takes, uh, it's strenuous. It could take all day. It could take multiple days, take many hours, depending on the size of the mountain. But it really shows our life living in the church. We go through a lot of ups and downs, encouragements, defeats, discouragements, victories. So it's, it's a, it's a, it's an adventure. It's a, it's a trek. But that middle part of the mountain, that journey is kind of the journey of our life as a disciple of Jesus. Then at the, the foot of the mountain, uh, we have what represents uh, the division between the spirit and the flesh. Because going up the mountain is a spiritual journey. We're hoping for spiritual transformation, spiritual enlightenment. But at the bottom, there's the temptation of the flesh. Um, now, this part's really significant. Actually, the foot of the mountain is the area of the desert or the land before the mountain. So as soon as the it starts going up into the rocks, into the mountain, that's the mountain, that's the body. But that's that that dividing line beyond desert and plain up into mountain, that's the, the foot of the mountain. Now, this is really significant. In uh, this is some Eastern philosophy or Eastern theology where, for instance, you um, wash your feet before you enter a house because you don't want to you want to cleanse yourself of the desires of the flesh or the world. And you don't want to bring that into your house because that's where your family is. So in a similar way, uh, God commanded that everybody be consecrated before they get to the mountain. Otherwise, there was uh, severe consequences because you don't want to bring that the desires of the flesh into God's presence or into where God's people are. So there is a, a, a cleansing, a consecration, uh, even sometimes a, a fasting of, I want to deny my fleshly desires because I want to commune with God and I want to be focused on spirit. So there's a dividing line when we start this spiritual journey. Before we start the spiritual journey, we have to cleanse ourselves of the, the desires of the flesh. So one of the one of these um, diagrams is basically the mountain of the Lord, one of these divine patterns. Uh, another one is a ladder. Um, a lot of the and a lot of these patterns you see in early uh, church history, Renaissance. If you look at the art uh, in the last two thousand years, you'll see the mountains, you'll see ladders, you'll see angels coming up and down. So the in the ladder diagram, this represents Jacob's ladder, and this is from Genesis twenty eight. We're not going to uh, uh, read the scripture, or discuss it too much in detail, but I just want to be able to show uh, the pattern is there's a progression of spiritual growth. 
Uh, also, you might recognize it maybe Stairway to Heaven. This is where uh, Jacob fell asleep, had this vision of angels uh, coming up and down off this ladder. But really the, the top represents uh, the spirit, spiritual enlightenment, living by the spirit. Uh, the middle uh, actually has, in the tradition is, it has uh, seven uh, rungs of the ladder as you uh, gain virtue, as you're climbing the mountain, as you're becoming spiritually enlightened, as you're being a follower of Jesus, um, you're gaining this virtue. And, and the middle part, climbing the ladder, also is a representation of the church. Uh, near the bottom of the ladder, uh, we have the flesh. Is you got to leave the flesh and get up on that first rung to start growing spiritually. But the ladder also represents ambition. And not necessarily a bad ambition or selfish ambition, but an ambition to know who God is, an ambition to, to connect with God and be able to live uh, by the Spirit. So another pattern, and this is pretty familiar uh, to our church family, especially uh, recently, is this maturity will. Now in the maturity will, it starts off uh, basically of unbelief, um, living by the flesh, um, not knowing, just, just doing whatever you want, living whatever, the, how the world dictates or how society dictates. And at some point, we desire to know who God is. We study the Bible, we learn what it is to be a disciple, and we're baptized. It's that consecration. It's that cleansing. Baptism is not a symbol. Baptism is a decision by faith to no longer live according to the principles of the world, but to live by the Spirit and as a follower of Jesus. And that's where our sins are forgiven and we live in God's kingdom, like what he shared about with Moses. But we see in this will, when you're after you're baptized, uh, you have the, the spiritual maturity of an infant. It's like you're at the, the base of the mountain or the bottom rung of the ladder. You're still learning. And then you start to grow and you're, you're, you're like a child, just like a sponge, just teach me, teach me, teach me, teach me. And then you're like a young adult, like you've been around for a little bit, you're a bit more mature, you're looking for ways to serve, you're looking for ways to engage your personal ministry. And then eventually you get to a point where you are a parent and you're ready to look after other people and teach and train other people, help other people to know God. And uh, so that's when that's uh, uh, probably most common for us recently here at Valley Christian. And uh, John 15, that's a where Jesus says that he is a vine, that we are to remain in Jesus. So in order for us to, to be spiritually mature, this is super, super important. We have to remain in Jesus. We have to be living as a disciple, as a student of Jesus. And the last pattern we're going to look at is the pattern of the human body. And so the top would be the head of the body is Christ, is Jesus, uh, he is the head because he has all authority. He lived a perfect life. He died for our sins. He sits at the right hand of God. He is the head of the body. And that's where we're, we're hoping to imitate. He modeled everything for us. Um, so if he's the head, the, bo the, the body of the body is the church, the body of Christ. And that's where we are. And at the bottom, at the feet, that's where the world is. That's where the world is, is ever present, letting us know, uh, you know, right where it's at. And our challenge is to keep ourselves from being polluted by the world, washing our feet, uh, not, not letting the, the idea of the, the foot of the body is like the dirtiest part. That's the part that you clean when you, when you enter a home or enter a dwelling. So we always have to be aware when we're out in the world, what we're bringing back into our homes, what we're bringing into the church. So for uh, most of the Bible scholars, they could tell by that last diagram that we're going to read Colossians. So let's read Colossians chapter one, and we'll look at some scriptures about the body of Christ, really based off that last diagram. But all, the, all those diagrams basically are communicating the same thing, but throughout the generations, different patterns were used uh, to really represent spiritual growth. Uh, but... Uh, as a church, it's the, the image of the body is going to be uh, one of the, the more helpful ones. So Colossians chapter 1, we're going to read verse 15. Chapter 1, verse 15. 
Actually, we'll start in verse 50. Yeah, verse 15. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. So a lot of this is representing why Jesus is the head, why in that pattern he is at the top, because we're all to learn from him and to follow him and to imitate him. And it's really interesting in the very beginning where it talks about he is the image of the invisible God. And it's interesting where you have an image, you think that you would be able to see something, right? And we, you know, we saw Jesus, he was in the flesh and he lived but of the invisible God, really showing that the whole goal of all these patterns is the spirit. It's not uh, something physical that, that we can touch. It's something that's in our lives that is, as we grow spiritually, it's something invisible. It's not necessarily something that we can, we can touch, but the focus is on the spirit and that Jesus is the head of the body and that the body is the church. And he was the first he was the, um, the first one to die and raise to life. So in the same way, uh, when we are baptized, we die to our sin, we are cleansed from the world, and then we follow in that same pattern that he uh, set out uh, before us. Now let's go to verse 24. Now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. There it is again. I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. The mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them, God has chosen to make among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. So what it's saying in the very beginning where it says, I want to fill up in my flesh kind of what, what Jesus left undone. So here's some more threes for you. Jesus' ministry was three years. He set the model, he gave the teaching, he was the perfect sacrifice. But building the church went to another group. And Paul was one of those, where Paul's ministry was over 30 years. So there was a lot of establishment of how, as followers of Jesus, we're supposed to live together and live life together, not a day or a week or a year but throughout our lifetime. So Paul gave a lot of guidelines and he ministered to living in Christ, uh, especially when it comes to long, for, the, for the long run, for the, the marathon, for the race. Uh, so, so Paul provided, uh, and he, was a, he gave a great model of a great spiritual uh, uh, parent. Then it talks about what is this mystery, this mystery of Christ in us. It's really that, that the, the mystery of all these diagrams of maturing in Christ or becoming fully mature in Christ, where we need to continue in the body to be able to gain maturity. All these diagrams are about how we're maturing, how we're becoming more spiritual and less controlled by the flesh. So that the mystery is, what does it mean to have Christ dwell in you or have Christ in you? Uh, another thing I noticed was strenuously contend. 
Now, contend means a struggle against opposition, meaning that in order for us to grow spiritually, there is a pulling us in the opposite direction. So if we're trekking up the mountain, gravity's trying to pull us back. The, the Our fatigue is trying to get us to stop. But we have to have a desire. We have to strenuously contend to keep going. The same thing climbing a ladder. The same thing maturing from a child to a or to an infant, to a child, to a young adult, to a parent. You have to just keep going as you're maturing. And then, uh, uh, of course, as, as the body, we want to be closer and closer uh, to Christ. And how are we going to do that? How are we going to have Christ in us? How are we going to remain in Jesus? Because we're, uh, we're, we're weak. We're, we have a tendency to, to be sinful. But it's going to be, like just like I shared at the very end, our energy has to come from Christ, has to come from uh, the Spirit. It says the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. So Christ has to be in us, compelling us to go closer and closer to God. Next, let's look at 1 Corinthians 12, and we're going to read in verse 12. And I'll summarize this uh, a little bit. Let's begin in verse 12. Just as a body, though one has many parts, but in all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit as to form one body, whether Jew or Gentile, slave or free, we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. So many of you that are familiar with this scripture, it goes on to discuss uh, that we have many gifts, that in the body of Christ, in the church, a lot of us have different talents. Maybe it's speaking, maybe it's encouraging, maybe it's administration, maybe it's just life experience. There's all these different gifts, and the tendency is to think that maybe one person's gift is more important than another, or there is... Um, uh, because I have these abilities or gifts, I don't need anybody. Uh, but in the in that the rest of the section of um, chapter twelve, it talks about that we need one another. Is that we form many parts? We have different gifts. There should be no division. Each of us need one another. We should be equally concerned for one another, and we need to suffer and rejoice together. So the idea. Though the theme of it is we need one another. We need to uh, help one another grow and mature because the goal is to get closer and closer to God. That's the goal of us being together. But God wants us to do it together. And he gave us different gifts to help one another. But the challenging thing, what happens is we get focused on the gifts. Well, what's your gift? What's my gift? Well, well I want this gift. I wish I had this gift. And that th what happens is the focus is on the gift and not that we're maturing together. Let's look at verse 31. This is one of the conclusions of the whole discussion about gifts. It says, it talks about uh, why it's important that there's different gifts. And it says, now eagerly desire the greater gifts. So what happens is, I don't know whether it's um, a discontentment with what we have. It's we want more. Uh, we want a better gift. We want our gift to be stronger. But the really, the, the focus is on the gift, not necessarily on the being in Christ together. And look what it says in the very next part. It says, and yet I will show you the most excellent way. So, hey, I'm trying to communicate. You guys need one another. Take your focus off the gifts and let me show you something more excellent. So this is what Paul was teaching. Now it goes into chapter 13. This is a very famous chapter, 1 Corinthians 13. It's, it's uh, uh, recited at uh, probably most weddings. Uh, let's read it. Let's read verse uh, 1 through 10. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, 
but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast. It is not proud, it is not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no records of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, it always trusts, it always hopes, it always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. The hope of being in the body, of being in the church, having our sins forgiven, being cleansed, being consecrated so that we can start this journey, it's meant to be done together within the body. So in order for us to get closer into God's presence, it's got to take place through the body. So what we need is love. We need those gifts. Probably in a couple of weeks, I'm going to do a lesson on being courageous in embracing our gifts. Uh, but I'll leave that for a couple of weeks from now. Right now, I want to emphasize that love is more important than gifts. I think that's what this scripture is communicating. Because while we're in the body, we need to help one another to get closer to God. So it's not knowledge. It's not prophecy. It's not these other things that are going to get us into God's presence. It's going to be love for one another. So let's see what Jesus shares uh, when he modeled uh, and taught his disciples about how to get closer to God. In John 8, 31 and 32, this is a very popular scripture. It says, to the Jews who had believed in him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teachings, if to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. What, what do we need to know the, the truth about? We need to know the truth about the mystery. What's the mystery? What does it mean to be in Christ? And he says, if you want to be my disciples, it's not just belief. You don't just have to think in your mind, yes, I believe that God exists. Yes, I believe that Jesus is God's son and he died for our sins. But we that belief should lead us to faith where we change our actions. And those actions are following the teachings of Jesus. So what's the most important teaching of Jesus. Well, of course, he shares that to love God and to love our neighbor. But then he shares this in John 13, 34 and 35. And this is something new that he's bringing. And love has been around. We're supposed to love God and love our neighbor. But he gives something new. This is a specific command in the body of Christ. It says in verse 34, a new command I give you, Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So the path to understanding God's nature, the path to learning what it means to love God and to be with him goes through the body, goes through the collection of disciples. As we learn to love one another in relationships, and this takes courage because it's so easy if somebody offends us or dishonors us or disrespects us to cut them off. But to have courage to reconcile, to fight for relationship, to gain understanding, to have uh, conflict and discussions, think about all that treacherousness of climbing mountains. That's what it's like having relationships with people or having people that are loyal to you or that you can trust or speak the truth. All those things we read about in 1 Corinthians 13, this is what we need to have courage in, in wrestling through, because the goal is through the body, through these relationships, through 
um, rejoicing with one another, suffering with one another, serving one another. This is going to take us closer and closer into God's presence and into this, um, this experience or this divine encounter uh, with God. So let's talk about some practicals. So we're going to do four practicals, and we're going to go off of last week talking about daily. Because in this spiritual transformation, why would why would we start and stop, start and stop? We just want to continue. Just like if you're climbing a mountain or climbing a ladder, it's another step and another step and another step. So that's what we're talking about daily. Daily pray for one another. And this is something, obviously, when we pray, we're taking the focus off of the flesh and going to and, and focusing on spirit is that God's going to work things out for, for, for his, in his story or for his purposes. But we're going to go to God in prayer because we want to be focused on the spirit rather than the flesh. But another thing that, that happens, uh, it's invisible and it's another mystery, is that if we're praying for one another, then that means we're thinking about one another. And then if we're thinking about one another, now we're thinking about opportunities to serve and to encourage and love in all the ways that we talked about earlier. Daily honor one another. Now, I want you to think of a time in your life where you felt honored. Maybe it was a birthday party or a retirement or something where people were sharing about you and sharing about uh, what a great person you are or just in their experience being your friend or a family member. And then just the great things that they shared, you just felt honored. Do those things for other people. Live in a way, interact with one another in a way where they feel honored. Where you're taking the ambition off of yourself and the ambition is a spiritual ambition to build up the body of Christ by honoring one another. Daily serve one another. Now serving is when we give both our time and our energy and the same thing, the, the, the focus is off ourself and our flesh. And the focus is on spirit as we look for opportunities to serve one another. And you might think, daily? Uh, how am I going to serve one another daily? Sometimes it's the small things. Sending an encouraging text message. A, a, a phone call. Uh, sometimes one way of serving is just praying and, 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 and let God, God meet the need uh, in spirit. But look for opportunities to daily serve uh, one another. And daily share the word with one another is if we're building up the body, if we're helping one another to focus more on the spirit rather than the flesh, if we're going to have courage in the body of Christ, we got to share the word. We got to share the scriptures. We got to build people up with the scriptures because that's how we're going to mature in Christ by knowing his teachings more and more, talking about them, sharing about them, encouraging, challenging. Um, but let's daily share the word with one another. What we're studying on our own, let's share it with our brothers and sisters. So I want to encourage you to have courage in the body of Christ, to know that that spiritual maturity is the path to having that divine encounter with God and coming into his presence and just growing in our spiritual maturity. Let's pray. God, we are so grateful for this time of Bible study to learn of the mysteries that are in this huge book uh, of teachings and storing and stories and uh, clues of your incredible divine nature that we want to explore and know more about. God, help us to be cleansed from the world. The world pulls at us. It wants us. Even in our bones, it desires to do whatever it wants. And it just wants to do what everyone else does, or whatever society dictates. God, help us to wash that part of our body, wash our feet uh, to really grow in our understanding of the Spirit. God, help us on this amazing journey as we climb the mountain, as we get closer to you, as we strive to become more virtuous, to have better character, to be able to imitate uh, the life of Jesus and his teachings. Help us to understand those teachings more. Help us to love people more, especially 
uh, fellow believers and, and fellow followers of Jesus, God, that we would treat them with special honor as we build one another up. Uh, we're continuing that journey to get closer and closer to you, learning how to love you more and more. God, I, pr I pray that you're pleased with us. Just like when, when Jesus was on the mountain and he was transfigured and he glowed with just uh, love and energy and spirit. God, we want to glow as we get closer to you because we want you to say to us, well done, good and faithful servants. Help us to serve and suffer and give and rejoice with our brothers and sisters as we get closer to you. We thank you for this time of study. We love you. Praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great week. Steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I will hope in Steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Let's be turning in our Bibles to Colossians 1, verse 15 through 20, and I'll be delivering the Lord's Supper message this morning. While we're going through Colossians 1, I'd like everyone to be focused on brokenness. What it means to be broken before God. And when was the last time that you were actually broken? before the cross. I'm going to share about my brokenness after we finish reading Colossians 1, verse 15 through 20. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. What a powerful scripture. For me, the last time I was broken was actually this week. I was... Uh, alone and I was praying and and I was thinking about all the the wonderful things that God has done for me and for my family for my friends and I started focusing on all the ways that I that I feel like I let God down not spending enough time reading and praying not spending enough time digging deep into the word confessing my sins to him and just feeling that total brokenness before God, the total feeling of without God, without Jesus, we don't have anything. Whatever we have, like the scripture said, it's because of Jesus. He created everything. He created us. 
I want to share a song by Leanne Walmack. It was about 20 years ago. And it was actually a song that uh, was a father-daughter song uh, when my daughter Allison got married about 20 years ago. And the song is entitled, I Hope You Dance. And I'm going to just read a, a powerful statement. I hope you dance. It says, I hope you feel small when you stand beside the ocean. Feel small, but stand beside the ocean. As many of you know, we lived in San Diego for over a decade before moving to Vegas. And we would spend a lot of time in the ocean, on the shore, looking at the ocean. And well, if you want to see a scary sight, look at the ocean at night. And I always said that I wouldn't jump in the ocean at night for all the, all the money in the universe. It's just very... Um, very overwhelming. And just like Leanne Walmack said, when you stand beside the ocean, do you still feel small? I know I did. I can remember quite a few times when I was younger, going swimming in the ocean and getting hit with one wave, another wave, and you're trying to come up for a breath and you get knocked down. Um, it's, it's very humbling. The ocean is very humbling. Jesus mentioned in Matthew 5, in the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Jesus wants us to have a broken and contrite heart. Because if we if we remain prideful, then we really have nothing to learn from God. We think we know everything. But we need to have a childlike spirit. And focus on the fact that we need we need God. We need Jesus. We need a Savior. We need someone to forgive us of the guilt of sin. It's all about brokenness and humility before the cross of Jesus. I want to close with the last stanza of one of the great church hymnals from, from many, many years ago. And this is from... Uh, the church is one foundation. It was actually Carol's mom, my mother-in-law's, probably favored him. Yet she on earth hath union with God, the three in one, a mystic sweet communion with those whose rest is one. O happy ones and holy Lord, give us grace that we like them, the meek and lonely on high may dwell with thee. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the life you've given us, the fact that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Help us remember that even this morning as we, we take the Lord's Supper, that everything we have, everything that we're ever going to have is all a gift from you. Help us to be grateful for that. Help us to be uh, feel good about our relationship with you and others Help us to feel, always feel, though, that we need to take it deeper, no matter no matter how spiritual or how spiritual uh, we are now or hope to be in the future. Uh, we just pray this in your son's name. Amen.
Thank you for joining us. We are so glad that you did. If you want more information about Valley Christian, please go to valleychristians.org. That's valleychristians with an S dot org. There you can find more information about us. You can sign up for Bible studies. You can get more information about small groups around the valley if you would like. And you're also able to give online if you would like to do that as well. Again, we are an imperfect people serving a perfect God. Let's journey together. God bless and we'll see you next time. Thank you.